when it was first uh, about to be published, I worried about how many children it would kill, you know, how many, <laughs> uh, not because it gave definitely the wrong <laughs> advice, but the, or any kind of advice can be misunderstood. And uh, I was always trying to lean in the direction of reassuring parents. Anyway, I was very pleased that after 30 million copies have been sold and uh, used, that nobody's accused me of having killed that child. The accusations uh, that it corrupts youth, uh, that didn't come until 22 years after it was uh, published, and that came as a reaction to my opposition to the war in Vietnam. And in 64, I was asked by Lyndon Johnson's campaign committee uh, to support him on radio and television. And I said I certainly would, because Lyndon Johnson promised in that campaign he would not send American boys to fight in an Asian war. Those were his words, whereas Barry Goldwater was uh, threatening uh, destruction of uh, Vietnam, just wipe it off the face of the earth. So I said, certainly I'll support him as a citizen and as a pediatrician and as a spokesman for the disarmament uh, movement. And I did enough so that uh, he called me up two days after the election to thank me. And he said, Dr. Spock, I hope I prove worthy of your trust. <laughs> and I had no idea. <laughs> I had no idea that he'd prove utterly unworthy of my trust as far as, Viet as, far as Vietnam was concerned. And well, you see, I'd been a, a, a liberal Democrat uh, from the time I was in medical school until uh, the Vietnam uh, War began. But those experiences radicalized me. I realized our government and its foreign policy is more often than not aggressive, uh, that it's trying to extend the power of, the, of our armed services or trying to extend the markets of our uh, industries. Uh, in other words, it's, um, the government is not working as much for the welfare of the American people as it's working for, the, for industry and for its own uh, power. So I became a uh, radical and, and uh, I became a socialist. And then Famous Dr. Benjamin Spock is with us tonight on Alternative Views. October of 1982, we had the great privilege of interviewing Dr. Benjamin Spock, one of the world's truly great people. That interview is as relevant today as it was back then. But before we have our interview with the author of Baby and Child Care, here are some news stories which we have gleaned recently from the alternative press. The extra copy of uh, July and August is mostly about Rush Limbaugh and all the lies that he's been uh, uh, vomiting on the American people all these years. But there is a small little article uh, written by the uh, editor of Extra, and it's about the single-payer health plan, such as they have in, uh, um, in up in Canada. He said the mainstream media have just been dismissing this plan, even though it's been introduced in Congress, the McDermott Wellstone single player proposal, is there, the mainstream media say, well, it's politically unrealistic, and they're not even talking about it. But the people in FAIR, the Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting, have examples both personal and corporate which show how the single payer system would actually benefit the American people. Uh, using them as an example, for instance, uh, the company last year, FAIR, paid 39000 over $39,000 in medical premiums for their private insurance company to cover 10 employees. But because in these insurance premiums have ridden so much in the past few years, they can't afford to cover half-time employees. But under the single-payer national health insurance uh, plan, FAIR would pay no private 
premiums, but instead a 4% tax on their total payroll of uh, $307,000. Now, this health tax would have amounted to $12,280. So that means that they would have saved $26,975 last year because they paid $39,000 in premiums, whereas the tax for the single-payer system would have been a little over $12,000. And then the editor says his family of three paid $732 in 1973 uh, to medical practitioners, deductibles, co-payments, and costs not covered by insurance. 732 But if they'd had the single-payer system with a 2.1% uh, income tax, uh, uh, to finance it, the tax would have come to $495 compared to the $732 they paid in all these non-covered uh, costs. And the publisher who gave birth uh, in 1993, her family of three paid out more than $2,000 in deductibles, co-payments, and uncovered costs. But under the single-payer plan, they would have had to pay only $585 in tax. So the, the mathematics is there. The single-payer system is much better for the total American people, but it's not good for the insurance companies, and they're the people who buy the politicians. Frank, there's an analysis, a post-mortem, actually, of the failure of the Clinton health care reform program to make it through Congress in, in these times on September the 5th that basically criticizes Clinton for failing to have a better program and selling it to the American people, and in particular, Clinton himself failing to pick up on something like a single-payer single pay, uh, plan that would guarantee to every American good health insurance and that would pay for it through some sort of uh, public taxation or financing. Clinton's failure to really come up with a good plan was what was responsible, according to uh, David Moberg, for the failure. He indicated that there really was a climate where health care reform could have gone through, that no one initially indicated that there was not a health care crisis. Everyone saw that this was an appalling system where large numbers of people are not covered by health care in this country, where there's out of control costs with hospitalization and doctor's fees and insurance fees are getting out of control. Everyone realized something needed to be done. Moreover, there seemed to be the political climate and will to actually do something about it. Harris Wofford made health care reform the central issue of his 1991 Pennsylvania Senate race and engineered a stunning upset. He won against great odds because he said health care is the key issue and he was going to work for that to guarantee the American people uh, health care uh, programs. And initially, no one was really attacking uh, Clinton's uh, program except for some small uh, business people and some right-wing uh, ideologues. But Clinton never really developed a good program that could be sold to the American people. None of the grassroots activist groups that were going for health care reform could embrace Clinton's program. One, they didn't know what it was because it was done by his wife and others behind closed uh, doors. And it was just too complex and esoteric to really explain to the American people, mainly because Clinton didn't want to offend the insurance lobbies and the American Medical Association and the other groups in the uh, medical lobbies and just basically uh, dropped uh, the ball and the opponents were able to organize against it and thus uh, defeat his uh, program. And now it's not clear that we'll have any health care reform. Here's just a wee insight into how the system works when it comes to pressuring Congress and the media to toe the line and not bring out the uh, other proposal, the, which is so popular with Americans and is actually working very well up in Canada, the single-payer system. Uh, Extra reports that uh, Koki Roberts, who's a biggie on NPR and ABC, she re received a reported $20,000 for a speech which she gave to the Group Health Association of America, which is an alliance of HMOs. $20,000 for a little speech. How many of you make that much in a year? 
And then CBS News star Leslie Stahl uh, received close to $20,000 for moderating a 90-minute panel discussion for the Healthcare Leadership Council, which is an alliance of insurance drug companies and HMOs. So these boys know how to play, they, they know how to play uh, the Congress, they know how to play the media, make sure that everything goes right. Labels That Lie, that's the title of an article by Ben Lilliston in the 1993 Multinational Monitor magazine, where U.S.-based multinational pharmaceutical companies that peddle drugs to third world countries often fail to provide the correct information that physicians need to administer these drugs safely and effectively to their people. Uh, Congressional Office of Technology Assessment, or the OTA, did some examinations of these labeling practices. According to the OTA's discoveries, two-thirds of a random sample of 241 drugs that are marketed by U.S.-based multinational pharmaceuticals fail to provide appropriate medical information to these third world country physicians. The OTA evaluated the medical appropriateness of drug labeling in four countries, Brazil, Kenya, and Panama, and Thailand. Typical of the problems found by the OTA were the following. The first, a synthetic version of the male hormone testosterone was recommended for treating women for frigidity and benign breast conditions. It was also used to suppress production of breast milk and to relieve menopausal symptoms. The company provided inadequate evidence that the drug is effective for these conditions and the label failed to warn about its serious side effects on this potentially dangerous drug. A second finding was that a drug for relief of pain and inflammation was recommended for a number of minor ailments such as headaches without mentioning potential side effects of the drug including the complete shutdown of the body's production of white blood cells and this could lead to fatal complications okay. this drug is no longer on the US market uh, it's, it's very interesting that they would have this article because about uh, oh about nine or ten years ago there was an article in the um, left press which indicated that this was extremely rampant and that there are so many drugs that are illegal and harmful in the United States they are being shipped overseas where third world countries are actually using these things and it was called the corporate crime of the century a third finding of the OTA was of a label of a magnesium containing antacid which instructed the user to regularly add the product to an infant formula and this was used to prevent milk from souring and from forming curds in the baby's stomach. It was also used to aid digestion and to prevent constipation in healthy babies. The company provided no evidence to support these uses and the labeling did not warn of the danger of magnesium overdose in the children. The OTA study did not identify the drugs or drug companies involved in the study by name. Representative Henry Waxman, who is a Democrat from California, and Senator Edward Kennedy, who is a Democrat from Massachusetts, released the OTA's findings in May. They both asserted that a listing of the drug products and the countries of sale should now be made available to the public. In These Times has an article in the September 6th issue that talks about how corporate America is playing a bigger and bigger role in trying to influence the political process and intervening with new grassroots strategies to try to control the political environment even more than they have in the past. They indicated that recently IBM Vice Chairman Paul Rizzo wrote a letter to the company's 110,000 employees urging them to join a grassroots campaign to defeat the Democratic, Democrats' health care program. Previously, IBM had stayed out of politics and certainly hadn't involved themselves in a corporate level where they try to organize their employees to take a certain political stand. But this is the new corporate strategy, according to In These Times. There was a recent conference, an annual Back to Grassroots meeting that was organized by the Public Relations Council, which is an influential network of corporate public affairs officers that were trying to persuade corporations on the need to get involved in the political process to organize their employees to reward their employees for getting more involved in grassroots politics. 
The first aim of this program, according to the article, was for the corporate indoctrination to take place of all the employees. Actually, this has been going on for some time in some corporations. I once lived next to an executive for AT&T who was constantly being taken to these different, basically indoctrination meetings or camps where they'd read all this right-wing literature and all the management and employees were indoctrinated as to what politicians or policies they should support, what their political thinking should be and the like but now the corporations are trying to organize not just their managers to indoctrinate them but all the way through the different echelons of the corporation secondly they're engaged in this corporate Leninist strategy where they're organizing cadres small numbers of corporate employees who will infiltrate grassroots organizations and try to push them to supporting the policies that the corporation uh, wants uh, supported. And then they also have a key contact program where corporate employees will connect themselves with politicians, keep in touch with them, pressure them, etc. Previously, on the higher corporate levels, the corporation presidents would give money to politicians and there'd be corporate lobbying, but they're now trying to encourage their middle and other level echelon employees to involve themselves in grassroots activism as soldiers, this is a quote, whose loyalty is essentially essential for victory in today's competitive environment. And these corporations were told to reward their employees who are successful grassroots activists. So watch out because the corporations may more and more try to influence uh, public opinion on every level from local elections and local issues to national ones through this new corporate strategy. And now for our interview with Dr. Spock. How many of you in the audience have been touched some way or another, directly or indirectly, by Dr. Spock? Now, Doug, you were a Dr. Spock baby, and I raised my children with Dr. Spock, and uh, no telling how many millions and millions of others all around the country. His uh, famous book was uh, ran in 25 million copies, I believe it was, and is translated into 25 different languages. Well, Dr. Spock is going to be with us tonight on Alternative Views. and. Also, a lot of maybe uh, not very well-known aspects about Dr. Spock. I think you'll find it fascinating. You know, there are few people in the world or even world history that you can just say their last names and you'll know automatically who they are. You don't need any more. They're that statue. You know, you think of Einstein and Freud and Dr. Spock. How many of you folks out there either raised your children in the Spockian manner or were raised? in such a way. Millions and millions. But Dr. Spock is a significant person in the history of the United States, right, Doug? Not only in child care, but in other fields. Dr. Spock has been active in anti-nuclear groups like SANE for many years. He was a prominent spokesperson for the Vietnam War. He's one of the first anti-war spokespersons I heard when I was a student at Columbia University and has continued to be politically active through the years. We want to discuss all of these things with him, but we thought we'd start off with discussing your theories of childcare, which is what got you famous and made you a personality and national figure in the first place. Could you reflect a little bit on your book that you published first in 1946? It's called Baby and Childcare and has gone through several editions. How did your theory of childcare differ from more traditional? theories, and over the years, how have you modified that? That's quite a, an order. Uh, I never thought of it as a theory. I can tell you uh, where I got my ideas. Uh, in the first place, I was brought up very sternly and strictly by a New England uh, couple, especially my fiercely moralistic uh, mother. And though some people have said, I suppose this book is a protest against the way you were brought up. Well, that's only about a third of it, uh, I think, that my interest in children, devotion to children, and those of my sisters and brother were all because my mother was real, totally uh, devoted to her children. So I think that's part of where I got launched uh, from. 
I cared a lot about their children, but I think I also thought there were must be easier ways, more pleasant ways to bring up children than the <laughs> rather severe, oppressive way that my mother used. Uh, I had pediatric uh, training after medical school, and then I thought, I've got to get some psychological uh, training. No other pediatrician had gotten that and stayed in pediatrics, so I found there was no place to get this training, so I took a year's uh, residency in psychiatry at New York Hospital. That uh, was occupied taking care of patients with schizophrenia and manic depressive psychosis. Was, this gave me nothing with which to add some others' questions about thumb-sucking and uh, toilet training and w resistance to weaning. Um, s but I did uh, discover during that year's residency that it was a psychoanalytically trained uh, people who were able to make the discussion of patients' uh, stories dynamic. So I said, I want psychoanalytic training. So that year that I started pediatric practice in New York, at the bottom of the Depression in 1933, I started in my own personal analysis and then for five years took seminars at the New York Psychoanalytic Institute. This, this explains my Freudian, my basically uh, Freudian um, concepts and actually, uh, anyone who knows uh, Freud, reading through Baby and Child Care, sees Freud uh, mm -hmm. popping up again and again, not in Freud's words or with labeled uh, Freud. Uh, they're the more positive things that you get out of uh, Freud. Freud was interested in where is the origin of neuroses. I was interested in the other side of it, uh, how do children grow emotionally, and I think Freud has given us very good explanation of the stages of uh, development. But it took me 10 years uh, before I could reconcile my uh, Freudian concepts with what mothers were telling me. Uh, my Freudian training didn't tell me, it told me that uh, sometimes you get into terrible conflicts with a child over toilet training. But when I asked my psychoanalytic uh, colleagues, well, when should you start toilet training, they shrugged their shoulders because, of course, they didn't uh, know. They only knew the sour side of it. So I had to work out with the help of dozens and dozens of mothers uh, what is the application. Uh, I'd give them the best advice I could on the basis of my theoretical uh, background, and then the next time they'd bring the baby in a month later, I'd say, how did, how did it work? And I was constantly having to revise my idea of uh, what is the practical thing to tell parents, and what is the relationship between that and uh, theory. This was shown by the fact that uh, five years after I started practice, uh, Doubleday, the publisher, came to me and said, we would like you to write a book on child care. This uh, wasn't because I was well known, I was completely unknown, but they had er asked questions around in New York and found that I was the only pediatrician uh, with some uh, training. I told them, I don't know enough. Uh, I, was, I was not being modest or falsely modest. I really didn't uh, know enough of the answers. Pocketbooks came 10 years after I started practice. The editor there said, uh, he was a droll fellow, he said, uh, it doesn't have to be a very good book, he said. At 25 cents a copy, we are going to be able to sell 100,000 a year. <laughs> well, uh, I wasn't insulted at all. I think, uh, first of all, the idea of reaching 100,000 people uh, per year, uh, that seemed very worthwhile to me. It was basically a do-gooder. Uh, I think that the other thing that uh, was that I was a perfectionist, and if he said we want this to be the best damn book that's ever been written, I would have said, I don't, I'm not sure that I could deliver that. But if he says it doesn't matter, uh, I said sure, I'll go ahead and try. In other words, after ten years, I thought I'd made enough connections between theory and uh, practice, so I went ahead and uh, wrote it. And uh, how many, how many lives? This is the incredible thing. How many lives have you touched with that? Book? Uh, I don't know. It's, <laughs> Uh, there are all kinds of scary things if you want to raise uh, questions like that. There were some very simple ones uh, when it was first uh, about to be published. I worried about how many children it would kill, you know, how many, uh, not because it gave definitely the wrong advice, but the, or any kind of advice can be misunderstood. And uh, I was always trying to lean in the direction of reassuring parents. 
The easiest thing in the world for a doctor or for a doctor writing a book is to scare the bejeebers out of people. And the previous books on child care all were along the general lines. Look out, stupid. If you don't do exactly what I say, you'll kill your child or at least make your child very sick. I was leaning a little bit backwards always to be reassuring, but there's dangers in being too reassuring. A lot of parents are too anxious with the first child, but by the time they have the third, they're remarkably casual. Uh, some of them. I, mean, I was scared. Uh, anyway, I was very pleased that after 30 million copies have been sold and uh, used, that nobody's accused me of having killed their child. The accusations uh, that it corrupts youth, uh, that didn't come until 22 years after it was uh, published, and that came as a reaction to my opposition to the war in Vietnam. Uh, I think that it was a purely political accusation. Well, wasn't it one of the presidents who said that, that we wouldn't have these demonstrations in the street if Spock hadn't have damaged a generation of children? <laughs> one of the worst accusers, the man who went all over the United States, was Spiro Agnew. You remember that guy? He turned out to be a common crook. <laughs> and he had the nerve to tell the American people uh, that I'd corrupted uh, the youth. <laughs> well, uh, several people did argue that you offered more permissive practices of child rearing, and that created a more anti-authoritarian generation that questioned more, that rebelled against authority more, and that this was part of the reason for the flower children in the 1960s, the anti-war movement, the feminist movement, and all of these different movements. I get, How do you I get stopped on city streets and in airports by uh, people who come up, recognize me, and uh, thank me for writing the book that helped them raise two fine children. And then they often add, and I don't see that it's permissive. And I say, mm. that's right. Uh. It isn't uh, permissive. Uh, I'm incapable of giving permissive advice. If by permissive you mean let them have anything they want and let them do anything they want. I very much like children and who are polite, <clears throat> uh, who are cooperative, and I raised my own that way. When my sons are interviewed uh, by the press, of course, the poor things are always asked, uh, now, what was it like being a child of your father? And they both sober up right away and say, oh, he was a stern uh, father. Mm. No, I think it was, uh, if by permissive you mean uh, understand what motivates children and try to uh, use that motivation uh, to help them to grow up to become more mature, more responsible, uh, it's permissive in this sense. Uh, but not in the sense that most people use it, which means brats. Uh, <laughs> simply, it uh, means brats. Let it all hang out. Let it hang out. And, it? Uh, now, I think that uh, if you want to be serious about it, I think I might have had just a little bit to do with the independence of those uh, anti-war young people uh, during the Vietnam War period. Because, you see, what I was saying to parents is you don't have to grab your child from birth and begin molding him sternly right from the beginning. Children want more than anything else in the world to grow up. That's why they practice adult activities all day long. They're trying to grow up and be more like uh, their parents. And uh, your job is to guide them because they're inexperienced and they're uh, impulsive, but they will do nine-tenths of the work. And I think what it did was relax parents and get them uh, to feel, well, the child in general is going to try to turn out well if we uh, do a reasonably good job. And uh, to put it another way, I think uh, parents didn't have to coerce their children or more specifically intimidate their children. I was constantly intimidated uh, by my mother uh, who made me feel guilty. When I used to come home from school or come in from playing, I cringed as I came in the house. What will my mother scold me about? What have I done wrong? I hadn't done anything wrong, but I always felt as if I'd done wrong. Well, I think that my book helped parents not to intimidate uh, their children. And the result was uh, children, when they grew up to be youths, and decided that the war was an entirely wrong war, unconstitutional, illegal, full of war crimes. They had perfect confidence in uh, just making that decision for themselves. I found it to my own distress when I was a professor at the Western Reserve Medical School a couple of years before I had to retire for age. I tried to intimidate the first year class because a third of the class was coming late. Uh, this was inconceivable at the time that I went to medical school. I tried several occasions to intimidate them. Uh, I finally thundered at them a little and I said, I meant it last two weeks ago when I said, please come on time or don't come at all. I, 
I raised goose flesh on my own spine. I, because it's so unseemly for a professor to be thundering at uh, students, and I, it in, it scared me to hear myself doing it. It didn't scare them at all. Just as many came late. Just as many brought coffee. Uh, just as many slumped down during the lecture sipping uh, their coffee, you can't intimidate them. Those were Spockian kids? Yeah, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't intend it that way, but that's the way it uh, worked out. Dr. Spock, but, yeah. But I think considering the terrible state of the country and the terrible state of the world, I think it's great that there are young people uh, who can't be intimidated, can't be made uh, compliant. I think the only thing that I feel badly about is that that spirit of independence didn't last, uh, you know. Uh, I ask teachers in high schools and in colleges now, what are your students like? And they said, all oh, very docile, uh, conforming, don't, don't conforming. Yeah. Uh, they just want to get good grades and go on and uh, get a good job. So obviously I didn't make any, any deep dent uh, in the young. Another reason for not accusing me of uh, corrupting a whole generation was that all the conservative youths that did go to Vietnam and never protested. They were raised by my book, uh, too. So it's <laughs> Dr. Spock, some people have claimed that you changed radically your child-rearing methods and theories over the years. Is this true, or have you basically stuck to the same that principles? That was a complete uh, misunderstanding. Um, uh, a press report uh, went out from Red Book magazine uh, boosting one of my articles, and uh, it was poorly expressed and it was misinterpreted especially by those people who assumed that I was a permissivist that I was that I'd turned against permissiveness I never was a permissivist and I never turned against it and though I've changed my mind about how to help mothers breastfeed and uh, about inoculations and things like that and those have gone into the revisions and I uh, also tried to get rid of the sexism that was part of the book in the beginning I never have changed my basic feeling that children uh, very decent people uh, to start with, uh, that they are trying to become more mature and that the parents' job is to give them guidance, to give them respect, but to ask for respect uh, from them. I mean, this, this is where parents, uh, some parents have gotten into trouble. They're so ashamed of the abuse of children and the oppression of children in past periods that they've jumped to the opposite extreme and have the feeling uh, parents are apt to do the wrong things, children are right, and uh, they almost become apologetic uh, to their children or submissive uh, to their children. Respect children, but ask for respect from them, and that's the hard thing uh, for many people to do. Well, Dr. Spock, during the 1950s, you became a household world in a word in America because of your child caring and rearing techniques. Then suddenly you became a political figure during the 1960s. The beginning of this was your entrance into SANE, was it not? What led you to become concerned about nuclear weapons and to join that group that was opposing? It was purely uh, a, a, a pediatric issue as far as I was concerned. Uh, the uh, director of SANE had twice invited me to join in the previous uh, three years, and I told him, no, I don't know anything about uh, fallout. Uh, I'm, I've always been a reassurer of parents. I don't want to start in scaring parents about uh, radiation. Uh, he very smartly uh, came back a third time and said he still thought that I ought to be part of the uh, committee. And I was finally convinced that if we don't have a test ban treaty, and that was the issue that Sane was particularly concerned about then, test ban treaty to be negotiated between the United States and the Soviet Union. If we don't have that, more and more children around the world will die of cancer and leukemia or be born with mental and physical defects as a result of fallout, uh, radiation from fallout. So I joined SANE, um, became uh, co-chairman uh, a year later, and had to become a spokesman for disarmament. Uh, but I saw it as a pediatric uh, issue. Well, wasn't the medical evidence accumulating during that period that indeed the fallout from the tests were causing cancer? Barry Commoner wrote a book in, I think, 1959, Science and Common Sense, that documented this in a popular way. Right. Uh, as the years have gone by, uh, the experts on radiation have kept having to revise their standards. Uh, uh, down and down in the sense of finding that less and less radiation is harmful to human beings and they've come to the conclusion there is no part, no amount of radiation so small that it doesn't affect at least a few individuals and uh, 
That's why I've become uh, not only an opponent of nuclear weapons, but of uh, nuclear power, too. Uh, we, we still can't say that it's safe to allow nuclear power plants uh, to exist and to be leaking very small amounts of radiation constantly, and that's what they're all doing. Well, Dr. Spock, it was quite a jump then, just from that medical aspect to being anti-war in the Vietnam yeah. era. What caused you to jump that? To the the uh, link there was that uh, I joined SANE in 62, and in 64 I was asked by Lyndon Johnson's campaign committee uh, to support him on radio and television. And I said I certainly would because Lyndon Johnson promised in that campaign he would not send American boys to fight in an Asian war. Those were his words. Whereas Barry Goldwater was uh, threatening uh, destruction of uh, Vietnam, just wipe it off the face of the earth. So I said, certainly I'll support him as a citizen and as a pediatrician and as a spokesman for the disarmament uh, movement. And I did enough so that uh, he called me up two days after the election to thank me. And he said, Dr. Spock, I hope I prove worthy of your trust. <laughs> and I had no idea. <laughs> I had no idea that he'd prove utterly unworthy of my trust as far as, Viet as, far as Vietnam was concerned. And I, I can still remember saying, oh, President Johnson, of course you'll be worthy of uh, my trust. And he only waited uh, three months uh, from uh, November 64 until the first week of February 65 when he suddenly started the uh, bombing of North Vietnam and the buildup of uh, fighting troops that eventually reached uh, half a million. I was horrified and I was outraged and uh, this was uh, just, uh, well, I, I became more and rapidly I became more and more active, accepted more and more uh, invitations uh, to speak against the war, which I saw as totally abominable in every, in every way. There was no redeeming feature to it at all. Well, was there something big that happened? There's another big bridge to cross from, from uh, disagreement to active opposition, and particularly civil disobedience. Was there something dramatic that happened, or was it just a gradual escalation? Well, I, in one sense, it was a gradual escalation. I think that uh, certainly Lyndon Johnson starting the bombing uh, was uh, the, the, the first uh, shock and uh, outrage uh, that I got that precipitated me into much more action. And then three years later, uh, I was, I and uh, three other people four other people, including the chaplain of Yale University, were indicted uh, by the Johnson administration, uh, they said, for conspiracy to counsel aid and abet resistance to the military draft. Uh, I was just trying to stop the war in Vietnam by telling the American people, uh, work against it, uh, tell the president, tell your senators, tell your congressmen. Um, we were tried, we were convicted, uh, we were sentenced to two years in jail. Fortunately, uh, two, uh, a year later, the uh, Federal Court of Appeals reversed uh, the decision, so I didn't have to serve any time on that rap. Mm -hmm. um, though I, ha I did, uh, for the first time in my life, experience the inside of a jail. I spent a night in jail uh, six or eight uh, times as a result of civil disobedient demonstrations. Now, when I first heard of uh, civil disobedience uh, in, as a weapon to, uh, to use against the war, it uh, scared me. Uh, I was brought up to be extremely law-abiding. Uh, as a child, I was terrified of the cop on the block, though I never did anything uh, wrong. I never dared ride my bike on the sidewalk. I never dared go out on uh, Halloween. So it was a really a tremendous distance for me to commit uh, civil disobedience. Even to be in demonstrations was very embarrassing at first. I cringed, and when reporters would come up and shove a microphone in my face <laughs> and uh, say, have you been protesting against what the Soviet <laughs> Union has been doing? And when I heard about other people committing uh, civil disobedience, I'd get goose flesh uh, right away and think, that's not for me. I'm, that may be counterproductive. But as the years of opposing the war went on and I saw that civil disobedience was drawing attention to the outrage, was convincing a lot of people uh, that uh, uh, that it was the wrong war. I, I was willing to uh, do civil disobedience uh, also, but I must say it was painful the first uh, couple of what times. What are some of the forms of civil disobedience? What was your first act of civil disobedience? What are some of the other Sitting acts? down in, in New York City on the uh, steps of the uh, in, uh, induction center. Uh, 
it was purely symbolic. We got together with the police department beforehand, and we uh, had a talk with the mayor about it, and it was all agreed that it was purely uh, symbolic. And uh, there were about 2,000 demonstrators in New York City that morning, 5 o'clock in the morning. If you're going to uh, be there when the inductees come in, it's 5 o'clock in the morning. It, was, it wasn't even uh, light yet. I can still remember how scary it was. There were 5,000 uh, cops there surrounding the uh, induction center and 2,000 well-intentioned uh, demonstrators. And uh, I could tell you a long story about trying to climb over the barricades, trying to crawl under the barricades, finally finding a chink in the barricades to get in and uh, just sit down on the steps of the uh, induction center. It was symbolic obstruction to the uh, War machine. To, to the war machine. And then the cop comes up and says, if you don't remove yourself, I'll arrest you. And you pretend you don't hear. And he just takes you by the elbow and uh, escorts you to the paddy wagon and off you go to jail. And uh, uh, it's, the, it's the boredom of jail, hour after hour after hour. Nothing to read, nothing to do, uh, and uh, just a, a frozen salami sandwich uh, to eat after you've been there about uh, eight or ten hours. Uh, uh, well, uh, it's, it's not a terrible uh, suffering to spend the night in jail, but uh, I often wonder how anybody could stand it for a week, let alone uh, a year or ten years. You had, uh, you made attempts to get through to and talk with um, LBJ again, did you not, either orally or in writing, and also uh, with, with I, Humphrey, Humphrey also, did you not? I, I wrote uh, many letters to Johnson uh, t pointing out uh, not only that the war was wrong from every point of view, but that it was unwinnable. I, I think I had a bit of a nerve to be so absolutely sure it was unwinnable. I said it was unwinnable because the French had found it unwinnable. They tried to fight uh, the Vietnamese for eight years and uh, were ignominiously uh, defeated, and I thought that probably pointed the finger toward us, too. Um, well, I wrote letters uh, accusing him of not only illegalities and uh, authorizing uh, war crimes, but also telling him, uh, you know, uh, if you go on with this, the American people will turn more and more against it, and you'll uh, end up by turning the country over to the Republicans. I thought that would uh, get to him, even if the illegalities uh, didn't. And, How did he respond to any of these oh. letters? The trouble was, of course, that uh, an assistant uh, would always answer, most often, uh, uh, McGeorge Bundy, who was a pretty high assistant, yes. and uh, I think the president would have done well to leave my letters unanswered because uh, the the uh, letters from McGeorge Bundy were the most condescending and therefore the most irritating letters that I've ever gotten in my life. General spirit of all of them was, my dear doctor, you may be sure we've thought of uh, what you're talking about, but we found that it's without uh, merit, uh, yours sincerely. And uh, I'd sit down and write another letter to the president, and finally I wrote one uh, with an enclosed note to Jack Valenti, who was one of his assistants, saying, Mr. Valenti, will you put this letter on his desk so that if he wants to, he can read it. I want to know that the president knows how I feel about what he did to the people uh, who voted for him as the uh, peace candidate. That did it. Uh, I got a note from the president himself. I'd accused him of 10 uh, crimes, and uh, one of them I didn't have solid ground, and he picked up that 10th uh, one and That's was able to... That's the non-winnable one? Not the non-winnable one, because he couldn't prove that it was uh, <laughs> winnable, but uh, I said that he sprung that on the country uh, by... Uh, bombing North Vietnam, oh, that's right. and uh, he s pointed out that he'd threatened uh, retaliation uh, both at the Associated Press Convention in April of 64 and then in the Tonkin Gulf Resolution of the uh, summer of 64 that he'd uh, threatened retaliation. So he had me. Uh, I was a little bit embarrassed to have over <laughs> overreached myself in the accusations, but I noticed that he didn't touch the other two six uh, what well, about, and then, uh, go ahead. Well, what about Hubert Humphrey? It looked like there was a chance that he might, he would have the opportunity to wind down the war, but he didn't. What kind of a person was he not to? Well, uh, I, of course, thought that uh, Hubert Humphrey, who I'd always believed was a fairly strong liberal, uh, would be opposed to the war. And after I couldn't get to the president with my letters, uh, I wrote to Hubert Humphrey that I'd met on a number of times in the past. Uh, 
sort of hinting around that uh, wasn't it terrible what the president was doing uh, to himself, to the American uh, people, and to the Democratic uh, Party. And I was rather shocked. Uh, I think he would have done better not to answer my letter. Uh, of course, he couldn't say, Spock, you're right, uh, Lyndon Johnson is wrong, but he could have at least said, I can understand your distress or something like that. But he wrote me back a total justification uh, for the war and this was quite a shock to me because in a mild way he, he was a hero yeah. of mine what I, was his relationship with Johnson was was it so was he uh, under such uh, control or intimidation by Johnson that he couldn't break out later when he was running well I, I thought that was the strangest thing about Humphrey of all in the first place Johnson had to give up the presidency he had to say I will not run again uh, he, he didn't say because I've made a mess of uh, Vietnam, uh, but he said uh, to reunite the American uh, people behind uh, the government. And then he anointed uh, Hubert Humphrey to be his successor and to have the nomination. Uh, and then this incredible business of uh, insisting that Hubert Humphrey run on the total support of the war in Vietnam that had already destroyed Johnson. Uh, I thought extraordinary that Johnson asked him to uh, to uh, to run on the same uh, Vietnam uh, platform, and I thought extraordinary that uh, Hubert Humphrey agreed to do so, because he broke out of the traces just a little bit, and uh, his popularity began coming up, but it wasn't enough to prevent the election of Nixon. Didn't you also get involved in politics with different groups? And I even remember seeing you on television talking about running in a presidential election, could you say a few words about that, of how that related to some of your anti-war activities? Well, you see, I'd been a, a, a liberal Democrat uh, from the time I was in medical school until uh, the Vietnam uh, War began, but those experiences radicalized me. I realized our government and its foreign policy is more often than not aggressive, uh, that it's trying to extend the power of, the, of our armed services or trying to extend the markets of our uh, industries. Uh, in other words, it's um, the government is not working as much for the welfare of the American people as it's working for the for industry and for its own uh, power. So I became a uh, radical and and uh, I became a socialist. And then in uh, 1971, a number of small socialist groups in different uh, parts of the country, most notably the Peace and Freedom Party in uh, California, got together. There were about uh, 10 or 12 uh, local parties. There was one in Texas, uh, uh, Florida. There was uh, the Human Rights Party in uh, Michigan. Uh, there was the uh, um, a party in Washington, D.C., the uh, st States' Rights uh, Party in uh, Washington, D.C. They all got together, decided to be a, an association, and then to form a national party and to run a national uh, candidate. And I was the candidate uh, People say, why did you run? I, I didn't particularly want to run. I mean, it was not my picture of myself. But um, there was a great, uh, there was a strong uh, sentiment, uh, obviously, because I was well known. And a party that doesn't have any members to start with, and that doesn't have any money to start with, and that doesn't have any prospect of getting any money, it needs something. <laughs> so they wanted a candidate who was known, so I consented. It was very educational. Uh, we got about uh, 80,000 votes, but we'd only gotten on the ballot in uh, 10 states. It's called the People's Party. Um, I campaigned all over the United States at my own expense. <laughs> this was 1972. <laughs> this was 70, the 72 uh, campaign. Right. And um, I had good-sized audiences, usually at universities. One of the things I realized was how far Americans are from really considering socialism. Uh, in fact, as you know, uh, most Americans are scared to death of the word uh, socialism. It immediately conjures up uh, pictures of secret police and uh, uh, destruction of churches and uh, trying to conquer the world. Because all that socialism means is uh, producing things uh, for the benefit of people rather than uh, for profit. And uh, I think it's a perfectly reasonable and a gentle philosophy and uh, our party was strongly democratic in the sense that we believed it should be brought in through the democratic process and that it must stay democratic uh, be controlled by the people uh, after it was in I um, 
I'd, I'd speak to an enthusiastic uh, audience and then always, uh, you know, a couple of dozen people come up on the platform. And one of the things that I'd been talking about the whole t hour of talk and a whole hour of answering questions was, don't worry about whether you're voting for Democrats or Republicans. Both of them are controlled by industry. Uh, the personalities are different. Uh, Nixon is different from uh, McGovern, but uh, the policies that you'll get will be exactly the same. Always uh, one of the people who was up on the platform. This happened every single night for a year, and it was terribly discouraging. The repetition, they'd say, great speech. You got me convinced we've got to have a different economic system. But of course I can't vote for you because I wouldn't want to waste my vote. Mm -hmm. Uh, what's the use of putting in two hours <laughs> on that theme and have it absolutely clear that he's missed the point altogether? Of course, what really is, that, what it really amounts to is, especially with undergraduates, uh, they're pretty strongly identified with the system. And though there may be a little recession here or a big depression uh, there, I think they, in general in America, have confidence uh, that they're going to be able to make out all right. And I think it's simply a statement. Uh, socialism sounds fair, uh, sounds sort of nice, but don't ask me to give up my stake in uh, the present uh, economy because I expect to do quite well. Well, they always, they said to you and a lot of people during the 60s and early 70s, now you got to work within the system, Dr. Mm -hmm. Spock. Yeah. You know, don't go outside the system, but is it even possible to work within the system and make any uh, meaningful change? Well, I think that the power is, of course, all on the part of the establishment and on the part of industry and on the part of uh, the government, and that people who have any strong protest uh, have an uphill uh, fight. It certainly was an uphill fight to try to win a majority of the American people over to opposition to the war in Vietnam, though it was, it was done in the end. I always worked within the system. I wrote letters to every politician that was supposed to represent me. I participated in in uh, political campaigns, always uh, voted. Um, I wrote letters to the paper. <clears throat> uh, I went to peaceful uh, demonstrations, uh, but I think if after you find uh, that the press is paying no attention to you, which is true, I mean, you could have maybe one demonstration that was peaceful, uh, the press would report it, but after you've had the third or the fourth or the fifth, uh, they get bored. They say that's not news. That a few thousand uh, people are shuffling around uh, the White House again. There's no question about it that civil disobedience dramatizes your opposition. It's saying, I feel so strongly that the government is wrong that I'm willing to uh, go to jail if uh, necessary in order to make this point. And uh, you do reach people that way, so the press suddenly pays attention. Last, uh, just a year ago, uh, I and my wife and about uh, 10 other people from the health professions uh, demonstrated at the White House. We knelt down on the White House lawn to pray, and that's against the law. <laughs> and <clears throat> we were protesting against cuts in health services uh, by the Reagan administration. And of course, we were immediately arrested. But uh, there were both Washington papers had half a page on it with pictures, and uh, Newsweek magazine had a, a quarter of a page on it. Um, I, I wouldn't do it foolishly or, or fool, in a foolhardy way, but there's no question uh, that it's a way of bringing the issue to the people. Dr. Spock, in your travels, particularly in the last 10 years when you've been working with these anti-nuclear groups and other political groups, do you see more of a consciousness that the political problems of America are not just single issue issues, like, for instance, ending the Vietnam War, ending nuclear energy, but that there's more radical systemic changes that need to be brought about? Do you think more and more people are beginning to see this, or are most of these political groups just focused on this one issue? Well, I think the traditional uh, parties are uh, uh, get... Uh, concerned about uh, relatively secondary issues uh, like should you uh, uh, should you uh, decrease the budget or should you increase uh, the budget and things like that my feeling is of course that the uh, the very fundamental changes have got to be made that we've got to have a less competitive uh, more cooperative society and I think there's a growing number of uh, people who feel that way but what discourages me is that we have to have either 
a terrible war like the war in Vietnam to make the American people wake up that something fundamental is wrong, or we have to have an administration like the Reagan administration uh, that uh, uh, is getting into what I call an insane acceleration of the uh, arms race and hurting uh, the American people, especially poor people, disadvantaged uh, people, by cutting down on health services, cutting down on educational services, welfare services, housing. All the things that I think are important uh, for people are being, uh, are being impaired. Uh, and uh, why it's too bad that you have to have a war in Vietnam or a policy as drastically wrong as I consider Reagan's a policy before any substantial no number of people uh, wake up and uh, at least wake up enough to uh, become active in any way. I think we've got some kind of a tradition in this country of indifference to the political uh, process. I think a lot of Americans say, listen, politics is a dirty business. Uh, don't pay any attention. Your job is to go out and get a good job and get ahead in the world. No, I think everybody's job is to uh, get a good uh, job. I also think that everything has got to be argued on the political uh, stage also. Do you see a third party as the vehicle for the sort of change that you're talking about? Are there any third parties like the Citizens Party today that you're impressed with? Well, I think sooner or later, uh, from my point of view, there's got to be a strong uh, third party and uh, people uh, t to the left end of the spectrum have got to get together behind it. But uh, I don't see any... And, uh, the, the number are increasing, but I don't think uh, that it's a very substantial number yet. I have hopes, and I'll continue to work, work, work. Uh, as long as I can stay upright, I'll uh, keep on working for change. And that brings us to the end of this Alternative Views. Frequently hear from viewers who request a list of news publications which we use on Alternative Views and also a reading list for U.S. power structure in the mass media. If you would like to have these, send a stamped, self-addressed envelope to the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. You must send a self-addressed stamped envelope. There are a lot of people we need to thank for helping with the production, making it possible. Kevin West was the camera person for our news. David Galicic was the director of the interview. Mark Zufeld was the one who set up the interview with Dr. Spock and produced it. Bill Crawford was a sound man. Roxanne Elder of the Mobilization for Survival made the arrangements with Dr. Spock. Alternative Views is a production of the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. Goodbye.